I'm LaShawn Jefferson, the Deputy Director of Perry Wold House, the University of Pennsylvania's Global Affairs Policy Center. We, of course, hope everyone who has tuned in today is keeping safe during these tumultuous times. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the World Today, a program of Perry Wold House. Today's guests are Ada Kuskowski and Alex Chase Levinson, both assistant professors in Penn's history department. Ada's interdisciplinary work weaves together approaches from history, law, and literature with the larger goal of understanding how legal cultural cultures developed in Europe during the Middle Ages. She is currently working on a book titled Law in the Vernacular, Composing Customary Law in Medieval France, which examines lay juristic communities in Northern France as they sought to theorize an oral and performed custom and express it in writing and in vernacular language. Alex is the author of The Yellow Flag, Quarantine and the British Mediterranean World. His published work has addressed trade, travel, and disease in the 19th century Mediterranean, Victorian spectacle, and perceptions of ancient time in 19th century Britain and France. He is currently working on a new project about British strategies, fantasies, and fears regarding national borders in the 19th century. Ada and Alex, thank you for joining us today. The floor is now yours to give us some introductory thoughts about politics during a global pandemic, and we'll start with Ada. Thank you, LaShawn, very much for that introduction, and thank you all for being here to discuss a little bit of history and think about how it fits with the present. Uh, I'm going to start with a few facts, um, a few kind of basic uh, facts about things that happened, and then I'll leave a lot about uh, repercussions for the discussion. So histories of the Black, De Black Death often start in October 1347, when Genoese ships arrived in the port of Messina in Sicily, and that, those ships carried the plague. That ship had come from the northern part of the Black Sea, where the Genoese had several important ports. And on this ship were dead or dying sailors, and they showed these black swellings about the size of an egg located in their groins or in their armpits. And these swellings oozed blood and pus. Those who suffered um, from this suffered with extreme pain and they were usually dead within a few days, within three to five days. The victims coughed, they sweated heavily, um, and issuing from their body was a lot of sweat, blood, um, they had bad breath, they smelled putrid and disgusting. And I think really what distinguished the Black Death, Black Death for for medieval people is that it spread with incredible speed, it had an incredibly high mortality rate, and it was a truly awful way of dying. It spread, like I said, like a tornado incredibly quickly and kind of in unpredictable movements, although certainly um, it spread by water. Uh, a lot of people think of the medieval world as one where people just stayed in one place and never left their homes or their villages, but actually it was a very interconnected world, definitely in the 14th century, where the seas and rivers served as highways um, and there was massive travel even by foot uh, for pilgrimage. And so it was a very interconnected world and the disease could spread that way. Um, it used to be that historians thought that the death rate was about 30%, but as we've examined new sources over the last decades, it, we now know that it was an average of 50%. Um, so the Black Death was rather erratic. It ranged from 20 to 100% in some places, but basically Europe lost about half of its population between 1340, 1347 and 1351. Numbers are difficult to arrive at with certainty because of the nature of record keeping at the time, which is actually kind of not that bad, uh, but still leaves us with many questions. Uh, but to give us a little bit of an idea, in the city of Avignon uh, in southern France, uh, 400 people died daily over a period of three months. So those are incredibly staggering numbers. And many other cities 
show um, similar kind of commentary, people dying in the hundreds daily. And I just want to read a very, very brief passage from Giovanni Boccaccio, um, who wrote about the plague. Um, and he said, the problem with it is people didn't really know, not only was it fast and severe, it was completely unknown. So where did it come from? Boccaccio says, some say that it descended upon the human race through the influence of the heavenly bodies, other that it was a punishment signifying God's righteous anger at our iniquitous way of life. But whatever its cause, it had originated some years earlier in the East, where it had claimed countless lives before it unhappily spread westward, growing in strength as it swept relentlessly from one place to the next. I think it's easy to look at explanations like that and think, oh, people were so primitive, you know, 600 years ago. Um, obviously, they didn't have the medical knowledge that we have now. What's important about it is that they used the best possible knowledge that they had, the best doctors to try to figure out what was going on. Um, and I can talk about kind of initial reactions um, and reactions from the medical community a little bit later on. It was only in the 19th century, about 130 years ago, that we figured out that the Black Death came from the Bactilium Yersinia pestis, and it's actually named after the man who discovered that. Um, so that's the name for the bubonic plague. It comes in a couple of forms, but um, it can be basically spread by physical contact um, and also by respiration, so coughing, sneezing, breathing. Um, and one of the things that we see in our sources is, um, you know, doctors catching it from patients and fears of catching it from um, inanimate objects or animals, which actually you could. So those fears were actually quite justified. One, one um, Italian chronicler, um, Agnolo di Turo from Siena, basically said that so many people have died that everyone thinks it's the end of the world. Um, I think that shows a lot about what people felt at the time. Um, the Black Death is actually a name that comes up in the 16th century. In the Middle Ages, they called it the plague or the great mortality, the time when so many people died, right? Death really kind of designated the plague. And I just want to note a couple of last things. Um, so I started with the Genoese ship, as many historians do, um, but our knowledge is changing a lot and interaction between historians is changing a lot. Um, and as we can see from Boccaccio's quote, right, we know that it came from the east. Um, so the interaction with the Genoese ship is just the first moment um, of bringing it to uh, Europe. The first moment of contact between Asians and Europeans was when that gen those Genoese ships were in um, the port of Kaffa, where they had been under siege by the Mongols. That indicates that the plague spread in two ways. First of all, by conquest, especially conquest of the Mongols, and the other way, trade ships. Um, it's a, it was a true pandemic, right? So a lot of the history, a written history has kind of concentrated on Europe, but it was in China, East Asia, the Middle East, Europe, North Africa, a true kind of worldwide phenomenon. And it was not only a medical phenomenon, but it hit the economy, social relations, politics, law, in many ways that we'll be discussing next. Thank you. So essentially nothing remained untouched by it. And on that note, we will turn to Alex. Thanks so much. Thanks, LaShawn, for, for the introduction. And thanks to everyone at Perry World House for putting this event together. Okay, so, so jumping forward in time uh, to the turn of the modern period, the beginning of the 19th century. The epidemic cycle, well, and I'll, I'll kind of cover the intervening years a bit uh, very quickly. So the epidemic cycles that followed the Black Death continued to kind of uh, ricochet around the Mediterranean world and around Western Europe for a few centuries after the 1340s. Um, so into the 16th and, and uh, especially the beginning of the 17th centuries. In this era, when plagues were still relatively common, the practice of quarantine spread. So lazarettos, and the uh, lazaretto is a word for a quarantine station, um, had first been built in Venice and Dubrovnik um, right around the time of the Black Death in the 14th century. Um, but uh, many port cities built, um, built lazarettos in the centuries that followed. Uh, so close uh, the connection was, as Ada was saying, between uh, maritime trade uh, and the spread of epidemic disease. Um, the word quarantine itself 
comes from the Italian word quaranta or 40. Uh, and 40 days was a pretty common uh, length of time that people were detained in quarantine. In quarantine. So plague began to taper off in Western Europe by the late 17th century, probably due to a variety of factors, uh, including the fact that uh, fewer buildings were built of wood. And uh, though pneumonic forms of plague, as Ada was saying, can spread through respiration and personal contact, the bulk of transmission of the plague we now think mostly comes from uh, rats and fleas, from fleas uh, biting infected rats. So when fewer buildings were built out of wood, um, uh, in fact, this was a major factor in ending the plague in the West. Um, in 1720, uh, the last plague in Western, the last major epidemic of plague in Western Europe hit the port city of Marseille in Southern France. Uh, and after that point in time, no major plague epidemics hit Western Europe. There was a 1744 plague in Sicily and that really is pretty much the last. In North Africa and the Ottoman Empire though, plague epidemics still killed hundreds of thousands of people into the 1840s. So that set up a major imbalance. Uh, and the quarantine practices that had been a temporary expedient in the centuries before became a kind of permanent rigid barrier between West and East, you know, one freighted with a lot of cultural significance as well as practical. By the turn of the 19th century, even in times of absolutely good health, no reports of plague whatsoever, every single ship, every single person, every single trade good moving from uh, North Africa or the Middle East to Western Europe had to do a quarantine of about three to four weeks. And that's if there was no report of epidemic disease. I want to draw out a few things about this quarantine system in the few minutes I have left. So first it was universal, absolutely no exceptions. Most of the people it swept up were not actually um, Ottomans or North Africans uh, coming to the West, but, but Western sailors, fishermen, merchants, uh, and travelers returning home. It worked by something I call mutually assured decontamination uh, or another, another kind of MAD. Uh, so if any European nation was seen to have lax rules, uh, every other port would put ships from that country in quarantine. So quarantine is entirely up to local boards of health in, in port cities, small scale bureaucrats, but the rules of those bureaucrats and the authority they had basically forced national governments to adhere to a shared minimum standard. So this is kind of uh, transnational cooperation from the ground up. No one knew for sure how plague spread at this time. Some argued it spread from person to person via contagion. Some said it spread through trade goods. Some thought it spread environmentally, so through the weather, uh, through noxious gases, through bad smells, what people called miasma. The medical arguments about this were incredibly bitter. So what the bureaucrats on boards of health had to do was grapple with uncertainty. Who were these people? Well, each board had a mix of interests. Um, uh, some retired merchants, some local aristocrats, maybe the city's mayor, uh, and, and one or two doctors. Health boards maintained the rules, not because they were sure which particular one mattered, uh, you know, and these rules were incredibly, incredibly particular and intense, sometimes laughably so. You know, uh, there, are my, there are letters after letters going on about how many times per day you need to stick your arms into bales of cotton and wiggle them around and which sides of the bale you do this on. No one actually thought for sure this was key to some theory about the plague, but it was traditional. And without certainty, boards of health had to say, well, the risk of dropping any one particular tradition might be a, a major epidemic. Um, so, as, as we're grappling with an epidemic of our own, there are a couple of points I want to end with that, that I think um, quarantine in the 19th century, and this system, this universal system lasted until about 1850, um, that quarantine in the 19th century can, can tell us. Um, and, and what's different now? So first, uh, as, as Ada was getting out with the Black Death, um, the mortality rates for plague, and quarantine was primarily based against the plague, but also yellow fever, which was uh, uh, imported to Europe a couple of times across the Atlantic, um, and also cholera, uh, which it failed to stop and which uh, devastated uh, Europe and the Middle East and North America and, and lots of parts of the world uh, and, and India, uh, uh, you know, as well in, in successive pandemics in the 19th century. These pandemics killed vast, uh, vastly higher numbers of people than COVID does now. So plague, 40 to 60 percent of people in untreated cases of bubonic plague. Um, you know, uh, but rather than pure terror, quarantine was an organized, balanced response. No one closed their borders entirely, but they enforced quarantine rigorously, and they made sure every other power did too, with literally no exceptions, not even for aristocrats and kings in a very unequal age. Cooperation was essential. 
So epidemics don't respect borders. And we clearly need a sense now that's similar, that epidemic control is above politics, that it really ha doesn't have exceptions, but that you do create a border that, that uh, acknowledges the need for communication um, and, and trade and travel. Last point, it's a totally legitimate response many people have now to the outright denialism and conspiracy theories that are out there to say, follow the science. But especially in real time, as we're dealing with a new disease, science can't tell us everything. It can provide data, but not policy. History is literally essential now since there are no epidemics within most people's living memory. But we can't cherry pick data and say this or that policy was definitely key. There has been no example in the past of a kind of broad shutdown of society that we're dealing with now. And in many ways we're flying blind. Uh, epidemics are always marked by uncertainty and historians are trained to show nuance and complexity uh, and to face the twin threats of a scary disease um, and a shutdown that can't last forever, we clearly need both nuance and complexity. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you. And thanks to both of you. And you've actually, in your framing remarks, um, answered and preempted some of the questions that are already appearing in the Q&A, but we'll start um, anyway. So one of the things that I picked up from what you've just said is that um, in many ways there was Right now, there's kind of, um, I would say, a lack of global coordination and cooperation. You have, on one hand, countries trying to do exactly, Alex, what you've described didn't happen, which is like close borders, keep people out, um, varying um, pieces of science and information, carrying different weight in different countries about what should be done, who should wear a mask, who should not wear a mask, how contagious is, um, is corona. Um, although there seems to be a consensus about kind of some of the behaviors we should be involved in and at a minimum social distancing for most people. But I'm wondering whether or not in your own look back at history, there are lessons that we haven't discovered yet about the transnational nature of the cooperation that's really needed to both stop a plague in its tracks, if that's possible, without alienating people from kind of other countries, other parts of the border, which seems to, we seem to be on the cusp of doing that um, in reaction to, to COVID. Um, you know, I think stigma is always a risk when, when there's quarantine. Um, and it's, it's impossible to eliminate entirely. I think one thing that makes the system of quarantine that operated um, in the early 19th century that I write about kind of better in, in some ways than what followed was that it was um, applied to everyone, that there weren't exceptions, that you know, rich people had to do it alongside very poor people. Um, and and there, you know, it didn't matter what race or ethnicity you were, everyone was quarantined. By the later 19th century, that stopped being true. It started being particularly focused on certain categories of immigrants, you know, where, which bias and racism and stereotypes were fundamentally undergirding. So, you know, as broad a reach as possible um, seems, seems to me essential um, and, and a kind of, uh, of sense that you can't really have, it, it, there's no point in doing anything if you have kind of some exceptions. So, uh, you know, the, the idea that, that uh, President Trump says, oh, well, I, I, I closed, I didn't let people uh, in from China. You know, American travelers did come to America from China. So, uh, you know, these kind of partial quarantines are the ones that seem the most unfair and unequal, and they're also the ones that are least effective in stopping diseases. Ada, did you want to add anything? Um, I would say that uh, in the Middle Ages, sometimes, you know, so for instance, quarantine, there's a lot of observation and patterning, um, I suppose, responses, especially kind of more official ones. Um, so quarantine, for instance, um, begins in, you know, Ragusa or Dubrovnik, um, but then other cities try to pattern themselves on that. Um, I was thinking about how Alex was talking about uh, the rodents, right, the rodents. Um, and I have here on my desk a source that talks about um, an immeasurable quality of vermins coming at them. So there's a lot of intuitive understanding of things that are happening. And in Boccaccio, you can also see people, um, you can call it social distancing. He wasn't a huge fan of it. He called it mothers abandoning children, husbands abandoning wives, right? Um, what he, for him, what he sees is the breakdown um, of society. And a lot of the reactions were, I think, less descriptive of kind of like the disgustingness of the disease but very focused on how people are reacting. What's interesting is that they have definitely a knowledge that it's coming from the Orient, but you don't at all see an idea that um, that those are the that people from the Orient are at fault. Um, a little bit like 
today. I mean, they had other scapegoats <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, um, but they had, yeah. So in terms of global cooperation, I think that, you know, if we look to something like the Middle Ages, um, not only focusing on national um, or interior um, events, um, reactions, methods of coping, medical developments, but really looking outside um, for examples is definitely a, kind of a good idea. Well, and one of the things, again, that's been mentioned in the Q&A function, and I think that's been on everyone's mind since the pandemic started to spread globally, is if not a reordering of society, at least a re-examination of priorities, of the way we live, of the way that we work, the way that we do our programming, the fact that we've got almost 300 people on a, a Zoom call, essentially a video today to hear the two of you, that we've had to recalibrate. And I'm curious, looking from the Middle Ages forward or through the 19th century, what were the ways, I mean, in some ways people expect like the entire global order will be challenged and upended. Others would argue that, you know, this will settle down and we will return to being the people we were before. I'm curious about what history has to tell us about how people and societies in power reorganize post-plague, post-pandemic. Um, well, I'll start with the earlier period. Um, I would certainly say that they're both right. You know, um, in some ways, one of the things that crises like pandemics do is they lay bare kind of like the tensions, the problems in a society, the things people um, feel are you know not right, unjust, um, and that was certainly kind of the case in the past, right? So uh, with the plague, they thought if God is punishing us, right, it must be because we're doing something wrong. And part of the answer was self-examination about how they should act. Um, should we give more alms? Should kings be more just? The other unfortunate part is the scapegoating we just referred to. Is it the fault of the lepers? Is it the fault of the poor? Is it the fault of the Jews? And so those groups were routinely attacked as a response. Um, and, you know, for instance, um, I can talk about scapegoating a little bit more. But um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, it lays bare some of these things. So, for instance, um, one of the most striking things in Europe after the plague, you know, a, a couple of decades after, uh, I think medieval society, it took a while to recover from the loss of half of the population, but we have all of these descriptions of you know, hoes left in the fields, fields left untended, right? Food going to waste, causing a food shortage, causing prices to skyrocket. People couldn't afford food, theft goes up. Um, so uh, consequences like that. Um, I lost track of the question as I'm describing all the things that I'm having. <laughs> well, we were, you know, essentially talking about whether or not, um, the society oh, yeah. would organize itself, whether we would, and you, your first answer was it was both. We would both go back to being the yep. same and we would be changed. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, historians still argue how much the Black Death changed society. You know, there were kernels of the things that changed happening earlier on. So some people say the Black Death ended, quote, feudalism or feudal culture. By that, I think mostly they mean that Black Death struck at inequality um, of the medieval period. But we can all already see kind of a protest tradition in the 13th century. But the nature of the protests in the later 14th century are I mean, quite different. There are kind of mass movements in England, in Italy, in France, in Eastern Europe. You know, we have kind of peasant uprisings. So I think what it does is it provides a really critical moment for questioning the society, seeing what the tensions are, and trying to figure out what world we want to create after the plague, but ultimately the continuity or the change is up to the people living through the moment. Yeah, Alex? I'd say, you know, it's it's kind of shocking how how much epidemics make people think the world has completely been upended while they're going on, but how much afterwards uh, there there isn't a lot of of upheaval. So you know, none of the you you can draw some connections between stuff like um, the second time cholera is threatening Europe in 1848 and the revolutions. I don't think most people say cholera is what caused those revolutions. You know, the the um, the kind of ramifications of epidemics to me, 
are, are much more about the long-term accumulation of fear than they are about uh, people changing their habits or governments toppling or any or the uh, global order changing that much. I, I don't think historically that seems to have happened. Um, but what has happened is, say, in response to cholera, in response to the legacy of quarantine in the 19th century and all these really really vigorous debates people were having about what caused epidemic disease. I think all of that contributed to momentum for building up public health infrastructure. So for governments for the first time taking it on as a responsibility that, you know, the state actually needs to provide, um, you know, sewer uh, uh, building, uh, it needs to institute building codes, it needs to have kind of isolation hospitals, it needs to build up an infrastructure to respond to public health crises. And so over time, I think epidemics do add to that. So I would be surprised if this doesn't affect our understandings in some way about healthcare, about the social contract, about the role of government. But I think in terms of, of uh, you know, ideas that we're never going to shake hands again, or, you know, never get on a plane for years, I, that seems to me harder to believe when we look at the past. Um, I want to go back to something each of you said rather explicitly, which is that at different points of different plagues, from the bubonic plague through the 19th century, you know, there was quarantining and a recognition that there was a collective effort to combat this and that there were almost no exceptions. But I'm curious about in both those eras, which is now a very long span of time, what um, fissures were revealed in terms of class dynamics. Not everyone could escape. Not everyone could, in fact, the 40 days that you mentioned, adhere to the 40 days. As we're seeing now, whether it's the New Yorker who escaped to the Hamptons or, you know, wherever people went, people who can escape plague-ridden or epidemic-ridden areas do, and what do we know about that um, from past experiences? Because there are obvious class differences and impacts on different classes can be obviously quite severe. Mm -hmm. Well, I would start by saying that it's always been a little bit funny to me that historians describe the plague as, quote, democratic, because it seems like democracy is something you buy into. <laughs> um, but what they're thinking about when they're saying that is that it didn't actually matter very much if you were rich or if you were poor, right? It affected everyone equally. I mean, I think that to them that meant that everybody could die from it, right? The best medicine could not help you. Um, and in fact, uh, one 14th century chronicler says, um, if you uh, want to die quickly and also be poor, just call a doctor. <laughs> You'll have no money left. Um, but um, so they call it democratic because it kind of killed equally. But, um, you know, uh, depending on uh, your financial resources, you certainly had different forms of escape. So one of the first things that happens in medieval cities is that the rich run to their country houses. Um, and in fact, Boccaccio, who I read from, you know, basically it's a book of kind of imagine, like the, the preface is kind of serious history, and then the rest is imaginative stories um, that people tell during the plague in the countryside. Um, the poor were definitely extremely affected, and it's one of the reasons that people thought they were causing it. Um, so it certainly um, affected people disproportionately. The moment that I just referred to um, with the peasant uprisings, I mean, that was a consequence of the plague that I think is quite interesting. So there were critiques of inequality in the past, and there were certainly uh, protests against specific unjust lordships, uh, but mass movements of peasants, I think, became, I mean, historians will dispute this, my opinion, but it became the Black Death and, you know, half of the population disappearing, half of the agricultural workers disappearing, did create a moment for those workers to say, not only do I want more, but I think I can actually ask for more and get it, right? It was a pretty good bargaining position um, to have kind of a big, um, kind of big shortage of, of workers. Um, and I think that that could certainly be an interesting thing. Um, the response to that, the governmental response, I think goes to your previous question where there was both kind of stability and change. So there was a change in idea, not only that like inequity was or inequality um, was wrong um, and people thought, oh, I can ask for more. But the way the government handled that was by producing kind of legislation that forced people not only to kind of go back to the field, but forced people to uh, work in conditions that were kind of uh, reflecting a pre-plague um, pre world of a depressed economy. So the plague kind of hit also a, a Europe that had a depressed economy already. Um, 
so yeah, but it is a great moment to um, kind of recognize certain things and ask for more. And again, I mean, it hasn't quite happened in the U.S., right? I mean, if anything, I wouldn't quite say it's the opposite, but it's certainly the case that a lot of low-wage and fr quote-unquote frontline workers have not, in fact, been able to rally and demand um, greater wages, greater support, greater advancement, et cetera. But Alex, do you want to respond to the question about the different effects um, depending yeah, on where I mean, one I think is economically? I it's a great question. I think the, the uh, you know, it's, it's tempting to view an epidemic as democratic. Uh, everyone is scared of the disease in, in, in similar ways. You know, people similarly don't want to die and don't want to see loved ones die. But I do think most of these epidemics, at least in my period, have seriously unequal effects on, on different segments of the population, much like we're seeing now. You know, uh, people called cholera actually a social reformer, kind of personifying it. Um, you know, there's a there's a great pamphlet um, that I uh, enjoy reading and sometimes assign in teaching called the cholera, the claims of the poor upon the rich. And it's trying to say, you know, we make this huge deal of this epidemic disease and get terrified of it. But this disease, like all the other diseases we say are, are fine and normal, kill disproportionately um, poorer people or Irish immigrants or, you know, other categories of society in 19th century Britain, um, you know, who, who were uh, significantly discriminated against. And that's obviously a, a clear parallel to the way minority communities in the United States and frontline workers, as you're saying, are disproportionately hit by COVID. Um, and, you know, th that, that led to interesting results in the 19th century so that you actually have a lot of working class people who felt abused by the state all the time, who felt kind of pushed around, uh, creating what they called uh, a, 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 the myth of cholera humbug, the idea that it was all, you know, something designed by elites to basically push poor people around. And you see real popular anger about this. So uh, there are some times when mobs would um, uh, demolish cholera hospitals. There's a, a case of a mob in Dublin rushing into a cholera hospital and pushing all the beds out the window into the river Liffey below. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's something elites kind of laughed at, but you can see the real anger is the kind of long-term welling up of a sense that um, the, the position in society that these people held had been so long ignored and that the, the penal codes were so abusive. Can I just add one little Absolutely, thing? Absolutely, Anda. Um, one of the things that, I mean, I don't, Alex probably has comments about this too, but certainly in the Middle Ages, one of the things that it almost immediately leads to is hoarding of resources, especially food. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in some ways, um, um, I think that the Middle Ages might have been even a little kinder than modern society in that at least in theology and moral theory, there was an idea that in cases of starvation, you have a right to steal, which I don't think our society has that. Um, so there was kind of a notion that this was kind of an extreme position that broke down the regular rules of society, but even for, you know, for people who are trying to survive. But I think the hoarding of resources, the ability to remove oneself, the extreme, you know, the ability to social distance, in, you know, um, those things are for people. Um, I, I will return to questions in a couple of minutes um, about ritual, because I think, Ada, you raised something very important, and Alex, you've mentioned it as well in your remarks. But before then, I want to ask you, uh, again, to return to um, the past to help inform the present in terms of human movement. So, each of you has said in different ways that there was not kind of a large scale effort to stigmatize or blame necessarily anyone for the various um, pandemics and plagues that have happened. What we're seeing now, not only is there an attempt to blame and to argue that China or someone else manufactured COVID and sent it all around the world, but again, the reaction is to close the borders and to try to control human movement. I mean, so in some ways, obviously, the world is very global now, and it's not quite impossible because it's happened, but it's very hard to control global human movement over a long period of time. It must have been even harder before um, and in the 19th century. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how governments responded, or nations rather, responded um, to controlling human movement as uh, a way to stop an epidemic as a way to stop a pandemic or a plague. How they handled that 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 question both politically and kind of culturally, actually. Yeah, I mean that's that's a great question, and and it points out I think the way in which stopping movement between states and polities and cities 
is much more typical of human history than I'd say a shutdown within societies. Um, so that our own moment really is unprecedented in, in that way. Um, you know, as you're saying, it's, it's incredibly hard. You know, now um, there, there are many more people in the world um, and uh, travel is so much quicker. So there's that difference. But in the 19th century, when um, you don't have a kind of robust sense of border control or ports of entry in the same way, the kind of logistics of the system I, I write about are, are shocking. So the, the land border, for example, between the uh, Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire had a kind of permanent military detachment lining the border, uh, stopping all um, you know, movement across it, uh, and there were different, there were kind of uh, between five and ten at different times, uh, bigger quarantine stations, there were littler places called rastals where you could put mail through to be fumigated, um, but the kind of logistics of this, and like the, uh, they're really astounding, and, and the way that boards of health um, became so adept at exchanging letters and communicating with diplomats and consuls, um, in the Middle East to say, you know, is that what's the state of health and, you know, what's going to happen? All of this, I think, shows us that a, the past, you know, even though we, there's not the kind of modern paraphernalia of state surveillance in the same way, um, it was like 19th century bureaucrats were pretty adept at uh, keeping a handle of what was going on. Ada? Uh, so I think there were, I mean, like Alex, the populations were much uh, smaller. Um, but the, so for instance, you know, something that people could control was ships coming into ports, right? Uh, and those were kind of, the sailors were put into quarantine for 30, 40 days. Sometimes they were told to go on an island um, and stay there until uh, the, the time had passed. Um, certainly sick people uh, were put in specific places. So um, the Middle Ages had a long tradition of that. I mean, in fact, it already had experience with another infection disease, leprosy. And lepers were kind of lived in their own communities, um, were very much feared and often blamed for certain things that were happening, including the plague. Um, so definitely there wasn't an idea of um, I mean, I think it actually is very interesting that they knew it was coming from the East, and yet, right, that was not a focus um, of the scapegoating for what was happening. Um, but the focus, like I said, was lepers and Jews, and there were many pogroms against the Jews. Jews being thrown into fire to get rid of contagion, right, because you didn't want the contagion seeping into the earth. Um, so, I mean, that's a really important reaction. In terms of movement, once the Black Death kind of simmers down a little bit, you actually have more movement than you did earlier because people are leaving devastated communities in search for better work. And so interestingly, you have people, people moving around more um, than they did in the past. Uh, but that's some of the things that some of the crackdown legislation on the peasants is trying to address. So the crackdown legislation makes them, ties them to land in a way that they weren't actually previously tied. So one of the things people ask is, did the Black Death and feudalism, I mean, in some ways, it kind of <laughs> created something more recognizably called feudalism. Yeah. Um, another question, again, from the Q&A uh, list. So a lot of people have posted things about the role of misinformation. Um, and again, I think in the, the current pandemic, it's a combination of, on one hand, thinking we know a lot about COVID-19, and I don't, frankly, I think we know some things, and there's a lot, we, we don't know what we don't know. Um, but there's also been, like, literally a little bit of misinformation in this country, and perhaps in a few others. Um, and I was wondering if each of you could talk about um, the role of, if there was, in fact, a role for, of misinformation between the kind of bubonic plague and through the 19th century and other um, pandemics and epidemics as a strategy as a strategy well by, by governments yeah. or by nations that's really by competitors <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's like that's you know the one case that i can think of that that calls to mind is is um because there were different lengths of quarantine for whether or not there was plague in the city of departure of ships um so you would get a bill of health every ship leaving that was either clean or uh, suspected or foul, depending on how much plague there was uh, in the city. Um, so it, uh, there were all these rumors uh, going around that uh, certain that um, say the the Dutch merchants would know that a br big British ship was about to leave 
Uh, and so they would start spreading rumors that there was plague in order to get that ship having a, a foul bill of health, um, you know, to, to have more quarantine. So, you know, stuff like that certainly happened. I, I think the, the kind of uh, state, the idea that um, heads of state start using rumors and, and start try, that we're seeing now, that does, that feels pretty unprecedented to me. The, um, the idea that um, a, a leader of a country would start just kind of speaking off the top uh, of, of their head, uh, you know, saying it occurred. You know, why can't Nonsense. we use, uh, some some uh, some disinfected uh, chugged into people? Uh, you know, and and uh, and that kind of thing. I mean, people did adopt very bizarre and idiosyncratic um, ideas about what you. There's, you know, I don't know. This is really disgusting, but um, uh, I will say anyway. There was one person who theorized during cholera in the U.S. because it was producing so much um, diarrhea. You know, and that, and that was what what killed you uh, if you just kind of. Uh, it found some kind of suppository that could just close off someone's rectum, you know, that could, you could just kind of tape it up and, and the problem, problem solved. Uh, this is not so different from, you know, the, the uh, Florida, a member of a Florida Board of Health suggesting you should take a hairdryer and blow it up your nose when you hear that, uh, like, the nasal passages have a lot of COVID. So this kind of idea that you can sort of do it yourself um, in an epidemic when there is a lot of uncertainty that people have this impulse, it's not just leaders and misinformation, it's this kind of desire people have to come to a solution. To, to, so, you know, some of it is understandable um, and, and it's, it's just particularly irresponsible when, um, you know, it, depending on who you are and, and the kind of megaphone you have, I think. Um, switching gears a tiny bit, we've had a- oh, Wait, can I follow up on that? <laughs> absolutely, Ada, absolutely. Um, so I think this era of siloed news um, and a lot of, I guess you could say, uh, personal production or interpretation of information, uh, various kind of governmental bodies on a national or international scale producing information. There's so much, but it's hard to know what's true. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things um, we can definitely kind of uh, think about through the past is the incredible fear that uncertainty causes. And certainly for the Middle Ages, the first theories about what the plague were, were um, apocalyptic. This is the end of the world. And those actually fade pretty quickly, but the first in, that was the first reaction, right, to the complete lack of knowledge of this extremely devastating disease. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, it points to a couple of things. Uh, first of all, how does our society deal with uncertainty, right? What tools do we have? And the tools that modern society has developed, like Alex has said, they all look to science. But when something is incredibly new, right, the scientists are also chasing the truth and trying to find certainty. Um, so, uh, so I think it raises questions about, you know, maybe how governments can handle and try to help their populace um, deal with the fact that actually there's some things we just can't or don't at the current time know, right? So how do we live with that sort of uncertainty? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'll just end there. <laughs> um, so one of the, one issue that's been raised in the Q&A really is, and again, something you all have begun to talk about and maybe we could explore a little further, um, issues of um, ritual. Um, I went to a funeral recently um, this past weekend uh, everything about that has changed in a way that I think is unfortunate and whether it holds or not time will tell but whether it's the ritual of handshaking and whether handshaking is done forever since as someone pointed out in the Q&A it's been known for a long time to be a way to easily transmit any number of communicable diseases um, or whether it is just the physical contact that we have with one another on a regular basis that is you know no longer quite as possible whether it's how we say goodbye to people and how we welcome people, a final goodbye in terms of a funeral or a general welcome to someone you run into on the street. So again, from the Middle Ages to now, how have rituals adapted? Have they adapted? We are still, you know, more or less shaking hands in the year. Well, we had been at least until very recently, but what can you tell us about how rituals change? Maybe some for the better and maybe some for the worse. I've, I, ha I mean, I think I'll focus my comments on uh, funerary rituals because those, what happens to those is really marked in the medieval period, especially in the first burst of the plague. So in between 1347 and 1351, you know, it keeps coming back and then after that um, they react in different ways. But in the first birth, burst, there's so many dead, 
that there are dead bodies lying in the streets. Uh, one Italian chronicler says that the masses of dead people were piled with thin layers of dirt and then he compared it to the way you layer pasta and cheese in a lasagna. I mean, that's just this incredibly evocative, and there's no tomato because they haven't discovered the new world yet. Um, but so he compares it to this kind of common food, right? But it's this very vivid image of the mass graves, mass graves that actually archaeologists are researching today um, and that are giving us a lot of new information about how it spread among who um, the uh, and you know, uh, lots of other questions. Um, but people do become very concerned with kind of burial and how it goes down. Um, different countries deal with this different ways, uh, but scholars have described England, for instance, as becoming obsessed with commemoration, and especially individuals placing themselves um, in history. So for instance, we start seeing um, vernacular epitaphs on tombs um, where um, People, we, saw, we start seeing um, people who are being painted kind of in their own likeness. And so partially you could say, you know, um, artistic ability has advanced to a stage where you can paint like good representational art. Uh, but I think, um, you know, that, and that's certainly the case. But I think the fact of the way that individuals are placing themselves, and the individual existed before. I mean, people had a, like self-consciousness in the past, but their desperation to, after their death, still have remnants of themselves around. I mean, that seems to be something that really happens after the Black Plague. Alex? Yeah, I, you know, I, I was trying to think of some kind of habit I could say that that changed after a particular epidemic, but I don't, I don't think there's anything that clear about that. I, you know, more habits of speech, you know, uh, uh, assumptions uh, about, as I was saying before, about state responsibility for public health, all that, absolutely. There's nothing I can think of like a, you know, a handshake that, that vanished after one of these things. And I guess, you know, the way I think about ritual is to say, I, I almost reverse the question and say how even in an age, you know, in the modern period, in the 19th century, that seems m more secular um, in some ways, in the reverse way, I'd say ritual uh, infuses the response to epidemics. So, um, uh, you, you know, even though there's no kind of scientific reason this was so, the Lazaretto in Nice, for example, um, in the port city of Nice, uh, stamped all letters that had been fumigated um, with uh, a crucifix, uh, you know, a, a tongue. It was a mode of fumigation, actually. It was a hot uh, uh, brand kind of thing that uh, was part of fumigating this letter. Well, there's no reason you had to do that. You know, the, the heat was important, the dipping the letter in vinegar, um, but this idea of kind of Christianizing as, as part of the arrival into, into Western Europe, you know, that it, it's infused with ritual. People describe being let out of a lazaretto at the end of quarantine. They say there's a bizarre ceremony where a doctor kind of pours some aromatic smoke on a little light and walks around you in a circle kind of muttering and you know that is the moment that you're purified so all of these ways that you know in a, in a kind of suppressed or even subconscious way uh people kind of uh looking for comfort looking for certainty looking for a sense of kind of ceremony and resonance and power to um affirm that what they're doing to stop a disease matters and is helpful um, I want to return again to something you've mentioned and maybe hear you both speak a little bit more on it. So Ada, you talked a minute ago about commemoration. Um, we've got a question from the chat about how this era might be commemorated. If you know, if you could put a statue someplace, where would it be and where would it be to commemorate the COVID pandemic? We've started a series of um, publications at Perry World House in collaborations with others across Penn. Um, one is a set of diaries that recount um, students and scholars experience with the pandemic. The other is kind of a, a post-COVID look ahead. And I'm wondering, again, looking back uh, from the Middle Ages to through the 19th century, how did people commemorate plagues and pandemics? What can we learn from how they did it? Was it a way of simply processing, processing and uh, memorializing? Or was it something else? And obviously now it's a historic record that all of you, you know, go to in order to, to do your work. But what can you share on that front? I think medieval people uh, definitely had a consciousness of themselves in history in the sense that the commemoration, some of it is personal. You want to leave a stamp, you want to leave a part of you, but the way they see that is for consumption by the future. I mean, they want people to come and pray by their graves, uh, which was a thing you very commonly did. Um, they want people to see the art. 
Um, and one of the things that comes out of this, I mean, some uh, is kind of a efflorescence of literary production. Um, so a lot of plague manuals, for instance, are produced. Um, there's, you know, um, testimony kind of like, like Boccaccio's, so more literary uh, production, but people are really interested in writing. And that's, of course, something that's happening generally in the 14th century. And the plagues, it's one of the things that is happening with. Uh, one of the chroniclers mentions that I'm writing this down because nobody will believe this happened. This is such an insane thing that it's happening. Nobody will believe um, that it actually took place. And they're quite interested in writing things down. I think representation, so there's first the visual and then there's the literary. So the, what, what they call the COVID diaries, that certainly reminds me of people writing down kind of their own personal experiences of the plague. Um, and these are being kept by you know, municipalities, universities. It was one of the first reactions was to start writing things down, whether it's Instagram or Facebook um, or blogs, right? The kind of impulse to write the personal experiences I think was definitely a, a strong reaction. Um, I believe there are also kind of COVID museums being formed where they're gathering objects such as face masks. Uh, one of the things I find really interesting about the Black Death, um, one of the reasons it was hard to choose an image for the poster, is that actually a lot of the Black Death images are misattributed. And I, I sent a, a link to an article that talks about that uh, for, for the listeners. Um, but a lot of them are images of smallpox or biblical plague, but we call them, you know, images of the Black Death, I think because for us, if we think illness in the Middle Ages, that was horrible, it was the Black Death, right? Um, so it speaks to kind of um, the myth of the Black Death in, in some ways. Um, what's interesting about the way that medieval people kind of come up, we don't have a vast amount of images of these buboes, these large egg or apple shaped um, 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 you know, uh, inflammations next to the lymph nodes, what we do have is a lot of representation of burial. We have representation of arrows being shot from heaven uh, because that's, uh, you know, partial interpretation was that God, it was God's punishment. And so I think it would, it's going to be very interesting to see how people are commemorating it, how people are choosing to commemorate it, and then also what we choose to collect out of that. Alex? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think, um, I, I, I'm not sure that there are, uh, the, for example, cholera in 1832, the first time it hit, um, uh, I'm primarily a British historian, so I'd say Britain, um, it, it, I know the stats for that, it, it killed only 32,000 people, which is a lot, but it's less than in one year, even people were dying of typhus and typhoid and lots of other diseases in the 19th century. I mean, what we have to remember is epidemics stand out, but deaths from uh, infectious diseases all told were just dramatically higher in the, in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think that there was a specific, so the kind of anticipation of the disease was a lot more than the actual death toll in the end, and I don't think there were really very specific kind of forms of commemoration for people who died of that epidemic, um, except that, uh, you know, sometimes um, both with that and, and with plagues in the Middle East, people are, are more uh, summarily buried in a kind of pit rather than with a, with a formal uh, burial, and that obviously bothered their families. Um, but, but society, I do think, tried to have big communal responses so that there was, even, you know, in 1832, a kind of national prayer day uh, that um, the, the country organized to, uh, to fast and to pray and hope that the cholera goes away. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of public partying and, and happiness when, when it finally ended. Um, so that form of commemoration is there. And I think, you know, as Ada was saying, I think it's super neat that people are trying to say, you know, to capture an epidemic, you have to look at this variety of things, um, masks and, and diaries. There's a risk in that, that you say the epidemic is kind of all consuming. And some days it feels like that to me. Um, but something I do when I, I teach an epidemic disease seminar and I, make my, I, I ask my students to read both um, Samuel Pepys's uh, diary uh, and Daniel Defoe's Journal of a Plague Year. Defoe's work is fiction. Um, it's a, it's uh, he you know is not remembering the plague. He's saying here's a narrator grappling with it, and it's all consuming the plague. There, it's you know it's morning, no, at noon, and dusk. You know all you can think about is the plague. Peeps is sometimes haunted by the plague, but more often talks about other things. Um, and, you know, it's important in trying to sum up a time to realize an epidemic is a major part of it, but it isn't the kind of sum total of everyone's daily experiences. 
Um, and as we probably move for the, to the last four minutes, um, I want to make sure that everyone who's tuned in looks to the chat function where there are a ton of resources now listed of books and articles that have been referenced um, during the course of our talk. Um, and to probably begin to wrap up with two things. Neither of you actually really said whether you would have a memorial and where it would be or what it would be. Uh, there, you know, there's an AIDS quilt, which is um, a lot of AIDS activists take great offense at the AIDS quilt for various reasons. Um, so I will not press you on and put you on the spot as to whether there should be anything commemorating the COVID pandemic and where it should be. But I want to move to kind of a final question that we're in some ways asking, you know, everyone who's a part of the series, which is that, you know, as you look back, I guess, at history, um, where you are optimistic about what is ahead in terms of how we recover from, respond to, survive this pandemic. What do the Middle Ages through the 19th century tell us about our own um, resilience? Um, and what are you, what do you find optimistic? What are you optimistic about? Uh, well, I guess I, I'd end on the cheerful note that, um, you know, all the epidemics I deal with have more survivors than, than people they killed. Um, and, you know, they, they ended. Um, and most of them were shorter than, than people were expecting. Um, and, uh, you know, societies, uh, the, the disease kind of fades into memory more quickly than people were expecting. So let's really hope that that happens now too. But Alex, that suggests that your, that your optimism is based on um, the simply passing and the epidemics and plagues die out, people die and then the plagues themselves kind of just end, but that we will be optimistic looking forward by just getting to the other side of this or is there something? I think, I think knowing that, I guess something I find personally, uh, you know, really hard with COVID is the way in which, um, the, the the end seems so hazy that people say, well, we're working on a vaccine, but we don't know if that will work. And this could be five years and, you know, not knowing, having shut down to this extent, not knowing how to get out of it, uh, you know, that's really hard. And so I guess, for, yeah, I mean, you're right to say, it's not, it's not right to just say, oh, we can be cheerful. You know, lots of people no. die. <laughs> like, what, uh, that, that's not what I mean to say at all. Uh, but, I, but, I, but just knowing that there's an e some kind of end, um, uh, and that it doesn't change everything. I mean, there's a lot it should change, but, uh, but uh, the fact that societies do actually um, retain a, 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 a kind of level of continuity afterwards, you know, in some ways that can be cheering now. And Ada, before you, yeah. add, before you, before you add your, your, your response, and maybe you can also remind us of how the Black Plague ended. Ah, uh, good question. <laughs> so I think Alex could speak more to that because it actually keeps reoccurring for centuries and centuries. And um, sorry to say, um, and some people say that we're still in the last phase of the third great plague. Interesting. Uh, I think uh, what pandemic teaches us, you know, I think it has different lessons for different people, first of all, right? It has a different lesson for governments and how they should act, different lessons for medical professionals. Um, I being uh, neither a government or a medical professional, um, you know, personally, I think uh, what I, th I think it can teach us, or it, it holds a mirror to our society, and we have to decide what, decide what that society is going to be. For me, it's hopeful that we started asking serious questions um, about our society recently, um, and I hope we continue asking those questions, especially when it comes to, like, you know, um, not only racial inequality, but also economic inequality as we move forward. Forward. Um, I also think that, you know, as it raises a mirror, we see things that we, you know, we in, the, in some sense shift our belief in God to a belief in science. Um, I think it's, you know, um, some, sometimes your teachers can be harsh. Um, and one of the things maybe we have to learn what, learn is to is how to live with some uncertainty in our lives and not having all the answers and not having all the diseases fixed and over. And maybe that's okay. Maybe we can live through that we have in the past. And to both of you, we obviously want to extend our um, deepest thanks for sharing your deep knowledge um, about the past and how it actually is influencing the present. I want to remind everyone online that they should join us two weeks from today on June 23rd at noon for another edition of The World Today that is titled The Race to Understand COVID-19 with the world's expert on coronaviruses, Professor Susan Weiss, who's also the co-director of the Penn Center for Research on Coronaviruses and Other Emerging Pathogens. We hope that everyone on this call will remain and be safe. We once again thank Alex and Ada.
Goodbye, Thank everybody. You. See you next Goodbye. time. Thank you.